Hey there, welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast and the author of the book, The Feeling Better 10 4 Program, which can also be found on Amazon. Today, I'll be reading from Week 7, Chapter 7. Week 7, Battle Plan, The Enemy's Playbook. Life will never be good again. Oh, friends, this particular piece of the enemy's playbook is something that I have to conquer every single day. So I'm just jumping right into it without any introduction or fanfare. Still to this day, I battle this. I'm working on it and it's getting a lot better, but it still creeps up on me now and then. I figured if I struggle with it, then I'm sure some of you do as well. Maybe it's because I'm no spring chicken. I don't have decades of my life ahead of me to have a fresh start and redo things from scratch. In less than 20 years, I'll be legal retirement age. Yeah, that freaks me out. And it also saddens me a little. I see people taking spring break vacations and buying summer cottages and taking their boats out of storage, and I'm over here like... Wow, I just gambled away everything we own, and I'm not even sure how I'm going to pay our propane bill. The devil is constantly telling me and showing me that other people have more than I do. He's trying to convince me that my life really sucks now compared to theirs, and that I mess things up so badly I'm going to be poor and embarrassed and ashamed of my failures for a long time, maybe even for the rest of my life. The enemy has told me over and over that people are going to laugh or be utterly confused by my lifestyle because I've become the bottom of the barrel. I legit just thought to myself only a few weeks ago, well, Maria, you're barely one step above homeless. What would your Facebook friends say if they all knew? And then I thought, well, they're going to know eventually. Look at how we're going to have to live in austerity mode for the next few years. It's going to be obvious. Oh, the devil is so good. He had me believing those lies more than any of them. As I mentioned, we were never rich, but we were comfortable. We lived a pretty low-key, humble existence. But one of the things we had planned last year was to buy me a new car. See, I do most of the driving. My husband has a huge older SUV that we use as a workhorse. It's got a lot of miles on it, but the engine and chassis are both solid. But with a Hemi, it's a gas guzzler, and it's not easy for me to drive. So we only use that on occasion, like plowing or towing or work around the property. But I also have an SUV that's pretty old, 15 years to be exact, And up here in Michigan winters with salt and snow, cars become rust buckets after 15 years of use, especially if you don't store them inside, which we didn't. My SUV has 240,000 miles on it, and the fact that it's still running well is something I'm so incredibly grateful for. That old girl and I have spent a lot of time together and made a lot of memories. I've prayed so many prayers in it while driving. I've driven it to Toronto and North Carolina, to Missouri and to Maine. I wish this car could last forever. I don't care that it has a CD player in it with an auxiliary port that I use with my phone to play music. Actually, that's a fun conversation starter with kids. No one under 20 knows what that is. That being said, though, just like me, that car is showing her age. One big chunk on the side had rusted through completely. The window and back hatch broke, and so neither shut properly anymore. I have engine lights that are on, and heat that doesn't work unless it's on full blast, and an interior that looks like it's been through a war zone, from hauling around cats and chickens and dirt and plants. We had talked about buying a new vehicle last summer, right around the time I started gambling. Not brand new maybe five years old, something affordable with a reasonable payment, or perhaps even bought outright with cash. The most exciting part for me was not going to be the new vehicle I get to drive with all kinds of fancy electronics. 
Although, admittedly, it would be nice to have heated seats for those brutal Michigan winters. No, the best part about our plan to buy a new car was the decision to donate my old one. I wanted to scour our area for a local person who desperately needed a car and then gift them with it. I'd clean her up as best as I could, give her a big hug, and then hand her over to someone, reassuring the new owner that she runs like a champ as long as she warms up a bit. Why have I determined my car is female, you ask? Well, when I first got her, she was fresh and pretty and smooth. Then for 15 years, I put her through every kind of rough terrain, steep grades, winding roads, and heavy loads, and she just got stronger and stronger. She's looking a little rough now, and she's complained here and there, especially in her later years, but she's never let me down. Sounds a lot like most women I know, don't you think? Anyway, in my mind, I envision helping out a single mom, or maybe even a retired veteran who was down on his luck, perhaps even a recovering addict who needed something to get back and forth to work, someone who would look at my car and see her value the way I do. Yeah, I could spend days writing about that particular metaphor, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to continue on explaining why this particular lie from the devil is so hard for me. Do you think that we're going to be able to do any of that now? Nope. Not this year. Maybe not even next year. It breaks my heart. If you haven't been the kind of person who gives generously, then you don't understand the joy I'm losing. Giving to people is so much fun. It fills your soul in a way that just feels so, I don't know, complete? Overflowing? I can't come up with the right word. The only thing I can say is that in those moments when I gave generously in the name of Jesus, I felt the most Christ-like. I'm so sad that I robbed the opportunity of someone to own a car that likely would have changed their life. I can't even think about it right now. It'll make me cry. My husband is struggling with this too, which compounds my situation. We love to go fishing and camping in remote places on weekends or holidays in the summertime. It's our favorite way to bond. We don't go to popular campgrounds hauling an RV of some sort. We pack my SUV to the brim with camping gear and then we set off for the remote wilderness of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We like to drive down the most obscure dirt roads in the middle of nowhere and then pitch a tent. Most of the time, our camping spots don't even have a hint of cell service. We rough it in every way you're imagining right now. But we love it so much. We connect with each other and with God, reveling in His beauty and glory. It's spectacular. We both interact with people all day, every day for work, so it's our time to disconnect from society for a bit. My husband loves to fish for brook trout in the hundreds of different rivers and streams in the UP, and the biggest brookies are in the areas that no one fishes, so we do a lot of exploring. But it's getting to the point where it's just no longer safe to drive that vehicle out into the middle of nowhere, especially if there's no cell service. So that means sticking closer to home, where there aren't as many brook trout, but way more people. We could take his SUV, but it doesn't hold all of our camping gear like mine, and it's killer on gas. Besides, his has over 200,000 miles on it as well. The disappointment in his eyes when I suggested we just stay close to home this summer totally gutted me. Then, of course, it feels like every day one of our friends or family on social media is showing off their new car or buying new cars for their kids. One couple I know surprised their 18-year-old son with a brand new, fully loaded Ford Bronco a few weeks ago. I have no idea how much that cost. $50,000? $60,000? How do people even afford that? They either must have really good jobs or are much better at managing money than I am. Regardless, it made me feel like the biggest loser ever. Here's another example I want to use to illustrate this point, which just happened last week of writing this. Before my husband and I got married and bought this farmhouse together, 
I lived in a huge, gorgeous old home on a big chunk of acreage. It was a rental, and I adored living there. It was seriously my dream home. The interior decor was dated, but it was one of those big, timeless old houses that had incredible woodwork and good bones, the kind of house that will always increase in value. The rent wasn't cheap, but it wasn't unaffordable either. I knew the landlords would one day want to sell, but I thought I'd have plenty of time to save up and get a mortgage to buy the place. But when they surprised me by making the decision to put the home on the market earlier than I anticipated, I was dismayed to hear their asking price was too far out of my price range. Funny, they listed it for 250000 which I thought was astronomical back then. But today, the darn place could probably sell for triple that, if not more. Anyway, I moved out, sobbing the entire time for my lost dream home. Later, I made friends with the adorable young family who bought the house. The mom is a stay-at-home mom, and the dad owns his own business. They're the loveliest people ever, and I'm so thrilled that they're the ones who bought it. They adore their home just as much as I did. We've been friends all this time, and I still see them on occasion. My hubs and I bought our current home for a steal after we were married. It's definitely a fixer-upper, and not as big or charming or timeless as the other one. But it's still a cute place that I know others would give their right arm to have. I loved it right from the start, even though it needs a ton of work. While we were never the fixing-up kind of people... We recognized what a great deal it was and figured we'd do what we could and then hire out the big stuff. Slowly, over time and paying cash, we bought paint and materials to spruce up some of the rooms cosmetically. But so far, it's all just been cosmetic. To increase its value or to fix it up in any meaningful way, the home needed some serious work that had to be contracted out. We finally got to the point last year when we began making a list of the things we needed to do in order of importance with an approximate budget for each. We'd have to do it in steps. We have some electrical rewiring that has to be done. The hardwood pine floors are scratched and stained and need to be refinished. The bathroom is outdated with a decades-old tub and it needs to be completely remodeled. But the kitchen was my number one priority. We had an old, outdated electric stove with coil burners that only half lit, with an oven that's off about 10 degrees. The cabinetry was cheap and shoddy and needed to be replaced. The kitchen floor was ugly and fake-looking with laminate wood that had been installed badly and kept pulling apart. There was a lot of wasted space that could be reconfigured. My husband is not your handy-around-the-house kind of husband. He can fix or repair basic things, but that's about as far as it goes. So we began hashing out a contractor budget and ideas for the kitchen that wouldn't break the bank. I'm pretty good at finding bargains on materials and was confident that we could hire an affordable handyman or contractor this summer to remodel our kitchen into a pretty, chic little farmhouse kitchen that would not only add value to our home, but would also be a housewife's pride and joy. Well... I guess it's safe to say that now that's off the table. It's not going to be possible to do any home repairs or remodeling anytime soon. That realization was also incredibly heartbreaking. I gambled away my kitchen remodel, and that was really, really tough. The salt in my wound came when I went onto Facebook the other day and saw that the family who bought the home I once lived in shared pictures of their brand new, very recent kitchen remodel. It was a big expansion with a newly constructed waterfall island in the middle. New flooring, new cabinets, new appliances, trendy lighting, and the most gorgeous farmhouse chic decor that was my every dream come true. I could have cried. Well, not going to lie... I did tear up a little. Those pictures were tough for me to look at. Believe me, I was elated for them. I knew that kitchen had been overdue for a remodel. Expanding it and totally gutting it in the way they did was going to add a ton more value to their home. But here I was, 
Not even sure if I could even go grocery shopping this next paycheck because we have so many bills that are still past due. Redoing our kitchen is not going to happen anytime in the near future. Maybe not even for a long while. Seeing the pics of their remodel made me feel like the worst human being ever. How could I be almost 50 years old and drive a rust bucket for a car? How could a 30-year-old couple with small kids and only one income afford my dream home and be able to redo my dream kitchen when I was here with no viable credit cards and barely a few hundred bucks in my savings account? I felt like the scum of the earth and a total dirtbag. My credit score was ruined. I had no idea when we'd be able to take a real vacation ever again. My home was never going to get redone. God forbid if we had something break, like our furnace or water heater. I had no idea what we'd even do in that situation. I've committed to coloring and cutting my own hair and canceling all of our entertainment subscriptions just to save a little extra money. I may even put on a garage sale or take some things to the pawn shop. I felt like such a big, ugly, son of a snapdragon loser. It made me so grateful that I work from home and live so far from everyone because if they saw my car and house, they would be shocked. Week 7, Battle Plan, God's Intel. You are special. You are blessed. Wait, what? What did I just say there? No, no, not the son of a snapdragon part. (laughs) If you haven't figured out by now, I'm the queen of Christian cussing. No, go back and listen to that again. The part where I said, it made me so grateful that I work from home and live so far from everyone because if they saw my car and home, they would be shocked. So, wait a second here. Of all the things I decided to be grateful for, one of them was that I live so far out in the boonies I can hide out from my friends and family where they can't see what I drive or how outdated my kitchen is. That's what I'm grateful for. Come on, Maria, get a grip. After having one of those pity party days, I could almost feel the Lord smack me upside the head. Let me tell you what I do have that I really am grateful for. First of all, I have a husband who not only loves me, but loves me so much that he stood by my side without hesitation when I broke to him the worst possible news a spouse can hear. He adores me unconditionally, despite all my sins and failures. That's a rare treasure all by itself. Just last night, he came up to me and gave me a big hug, telling me to never ever forget how strong our love is and how crazy we are about each other. That meant the world to me, wrapped up in his arms and knowing he'll always stand by my side. But do you know what else I have? A cool old farmhouse on acreage in the country that probably millions who live in big cities would give anything to have, with my own chickens and gardens. I mean, just having our own eggs probably brings a gleam of envy to anyone who relies on store-bought eggs right now. Am I right? Hey, guess what else I have? A job where I work from home. I can sleep in until 8 a.m., have a leisurely cup of coffee, work in my slippers with a cat on my lap, and have zero commute. Oh, and guess what else? It's a job where I earn a paycheck. I'm not saying any of that to brag. What I am saying is this. The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Those aren't my words. I borrowed them from Pastor Craig Groeschel. I hope he doesn't mind me referencing them here. You know what else he says? Where comparison begins... Contentment ends. Thank you, again, Pastor Craig, for those pearls of wisdom. Man, is he right. The second I start comparing myself to other people or looking at what others have, it kills my gratitude. And gratitude is what keeps me going every day. It's what keeps me connected to God and living out His purpose with eagerness and joy. The very moment I begin to think I have less than anyone else or everyone else, I feel defeated. And when I feel defeated, I begin thinking there's something wrong with me. Then depression and anxiety set in, 
And then I'm right back to the beginning again, right where Satan wants me. Sad, depressed, defeated, unworthy. That's the enemy's game. I've said it a dozen times by now. He wants to defeat us. He wants to pull us down. He will use whatever way works. And in most humans, certainly most Americans, comparison to others almost always works. Comparing yourself to others feeds that dark wolf. God really helped me to understand this. He allowed me to immediately see that gratitude shifts my world from disappointment to peace. Paul explains this mindset in Philippians. Many people, myself included, love to quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I think the context before that is even more powerful. Verses 11 and 12 say, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. That changed my perspective almost instantly. It's not all Paul has to say about contentment. He also says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Isn't that the truth? All the billionaires and multimillionaires in the world go out the same way I'm going to, taking nothing with us. Elon Musk will die with the same amount of money and possessions in hand that I do. Kim Kardashian will die taking the same amount of money and possessions with her that I do. That's right. Nothing. We go into this world with nothing and we leave this world with nothing. God's got his treasure waiting for us in heaven, ready to hand over when it's time. Every time we do a good deed or help someone out or love on other people, we continue to add to that bank of treasure. God's heavenly jackpot continues to grow and grow with no chance of another person getting it instead of you. It's not going to reset. It's yours, ready to pay out at precisely the right moment. You just have to keep playing the game of life, my friend. So now, with that understanding, if anyone at all in my future says anything negative about the way my car looks or the state of our home and its lack of repairs, I'm going to say something like this. Hey, I know you couldn't know this, but I went through something super traumatic this year. And the result of that was that God did some incredible work in me. And now I'm on a mission for him, working for his kingdom. Instead of spending money on material things, I'm storing up my treasures in heaven. It's cool. Don't feel bad for me. I'm beyond honored that God chose me, of all people, to do this very special purpose. And I'm excited to rock it. Jesus spent his ministry on foot without a home or extra clothes or even a pillow. So I'm good with my trusty old rust bucket. I've got bigger things on my plate than an expensive car note. Boom, mic drop. Of course, you could also take that opportunity to ask if they know Jesus because maybe they'd like to hear more. Just saying. You don't want to be snarky with someone when you have the opportunity to share with them the secrets to eternal life and to their own special eternal jackpot. Have grace with them. Don't forget the fact that because of your endurance of trials, you persevered. And through your perseverance, you became complete, lacking nothing. Remember that? So while they might lack nothing in the material possessions or the fancy vacations department or the kitchen remodels, you lack nothing in the spiritual God-honoring department. Guess which one matters more to God? Maybe, if they're lucky, <laughs> they'll have a chance to endure some trials of their own so that they can persevere and become complete in God too. You, my friend, are special. You are blessed. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you so that your sins may be forgiven, so that you would have eternal life, so that you would have a special purpose. 
Count your blessings, literally. Remember, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Say that over and over. Don't kill your specialness by comparing it to others and what they have. You know what I did after that revelation? I deleted my Facebook. I also deleted or unfollowed most everyone on Instagram. I now just use it as my own personal photo album, and I look at reels from total strangers who post inspirational or faith-based content. Social media had become the arena where I compared my own everyday struggle to everyone else's highlight reel, as Pastor Craig likes to phrase it. I knew that the people I cared most about would still find me via text or email or (gasps) gasp, even an actual phone call. But those who didn't understand or who had something to say could just kiss my caboose. I'm done with the comparisons. Bye-bye, social media. I'm going to be so much better for it. Okay, so before I move on to the next part, I have to pause and interject with the story here. First of all, how do I sound? Do I sound crisper? Clearer? More professional? Check it out. So, about a week ago, I'd reached out to some dear friends of ours who knew a little something about podcasting. I say that with a wink because their podcast is wildly popular and super successful. One of the top in their genre. I broke down and told them a brief overview of my gambling addiction. Now, my hubby and I have told a small circle of friends, but it's not something we've made known outside of a select few. But this couple we trust with our lives. They have good hearts. So I knew they wouldn't judge me. I gave them the lowdown, assured them I was okay, that we were okay, despite what I'd done to our finances. And then I asked for some advice on how to edit my recordings so that I have less pops and hisses and background fuzziness and breathiness. Remember, I've just been speaking into my older iPhone while sitting in my pantry for some soundproofing. I literally balanced my laptop on a stack of rice while precariously perching my iPhone on a shelf propped up by some canisters of sugar. And even though some have assured me the sound was fine, I didn't want to turn people off if it didn't sound that great. Anyway, the husband of this couple we'll call him T, came back with a heartfelt apology and told me that he was sorry. He told me his brother's wife had a gambling addiction and that their marriage didn't make it, and that he'd suffered greatly as a result. But he'd have a listen to one of my episodes and help give me some pointers. At that, my heart sank. I believed that I had just blown it. That from now on, these precious friends of ours who thought so highly of us would now look at me like I was scum. I mean, his own brother had dealt with this issue in the worst way possible, devastating his life. How could they not respond to my news with anger, resentment, and disgust and feel sorry for my husband for what he went through? Later that day, my hubby's phone rang and he said, It's tea. I felt a bit sick. I didn't want to be a witness to the bashing and berating I'm sure would ensue as T told my hubby about what happened with his brother. I had no doubt he called to offer moral support. Not wanting to hear any of the conversation, I jumped up and went to go take a shower. After about ten minutes, my hubby stuck his head in. T said he's going to send you something. I groaned inwardly. Like a voodoo doll? I said jokingly, but not jokingly. No, my husband chuckled. Not a voodoo doll. Something to help with your podcast. Oh, like some YouTube videos or some links? Is it going to come through email or messenger? No, my hubby said. It's something he's sending to the house. Well, that was too kind of them, I thought. I knew these two friends of ours had hearts of gold, And then I felt kind of silly that I assumed they'd hate my guts or be disgusted with me. I assumed they sent me a book about podcasting and audio editing. I really needed some help, and a book was just the thing. Sometimes YouTube or Google results can be overwhelming and a little bit confusing. I had forgotten about that conversation until a week later. It was a Wednesday night, about 5.30 p.m., 
and my hubs was downstairs getting his workout in. I had just finished up work and was enjoying some alone time. I had my Bible open on my lap, reading and highlighting some scripture, when suddenly I saw the FedEx truck pull up in the driveway. I got up, retrieved the box, and opened it. What I saw made me gasp and immediately well up with tears. Inside the box was a full podcasting setup, a top-of-the-line studio-quality microphone and headphones, and they also sent a pop filter and noise isolation shield, stuff that I didn't know anything about but was super cool. When I realized what I was looking at, I just burst into tears. Happy tears for once, though. Man, I was so, so thankful. I couldn't believe it. While I do my best to see the positive in my situation and feel joy in all things, the moments of serendipitous excitement and delight are almost non-existent these days. I'd been having a rough week with a bit of a downcast spirit, mostly due to the winter weather that just won't go away. And this was exactly what I needed to bolster my mood. When I'd been reading my Bible before FedEx showed up, I had been doing a Bible study that pointed me to Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I don't have time to relay the conversation that took place afterward with T when I got on the phone to thank him and as he gave me instructions on how to set it up and use it but I hope I conveyed to him just how special that was and how much it meant to me. There was zero judgment on their end. I told them that their gift was the epitome of mercy and grace, and that I was so humble that they blessed me in that way. I know that this couple gets it. When I talked earlier about how much fun it is to bless people and to give to others, this is what I'm talking about. I was weepy for about two hours as I recorded a couple of tests, grinning through watery eyes as I tried out my new equipment. There isn't a single human being on the planet who is more excited or more grateful to receive such a gift. I told them that I'm so looking forward to using it and to also paying it forward someday when I'm in the right financial position. Isn't that amazing? So, not only am I a legit podcaster now, but through the very generous hearts of our friends, I was reminded that I am not a loser, and that there is grace and forgiveness that surrounds us. There is also blessing. The most surprising thing to come out of this whole incident is that I had forgotten what it felt like to be excited about something. It's been such a long time since I felt that way. Week 7. Battle Plan. Weaponry. Your Gratitude Journal. Don't groan over this one. Men, I'm talking to you. The gals are already hunting down colored pens and stencils and stickers to put on their adorable new journal, found discounted at Hobby Lobby, I'm sure. I know it sounds cliche, like some kind of Beth Moore thing that women's groups partake in. It's not. It's so much more than that. Don't even call it a gratitude journal. Call it my feeding plan for the light wolf. Take out your phone or open up a Word doc or find a notebook and begin writing. I want you to list every single thing you're grateful for. It doesn't matter how small it is or what anyone else might think. I'm grateful for my husband's farts because it only means he ate something with dairy, not that he's got some kind of stomach cancer. My vehicle might be a falling apart rust bucket, but Lord, I am so, so incredibly grateful it still runs. I'm grateful that the days are getting longer and that spring is almost here. I'm grateful that I have incredibly tasty and nourishing grass-fed beef in my freezer that I got as a deal last fall from a local farm down the road. I'm grateful that I'm a mild hoarder because I don't have to buy much and spend money that I don't have on things like paper products or toiletries. I'm grateful my new cat has bonded with me in a special way that always makes me smile. I'm grateful that God chose me for this special life with this special mission and that I will be impacting others in a positive way. Your turn. Make a list. What are you thankful for? 
What in your life, no matter how small, feels like a blessing? What overflows your heart and makes you smile in gratitude? Write it all down. Make it easily accessible so that you can keep adding to it like a grocery list. Then, pull it out each morning and read it. The more you read it, the more it will impact you in a way that I think will surprise the stuffing out of you. Can I challenge you to read your gratitude journal every morning? If you're feeling creative, write something out in a detailed way every day or whenever you think of it. Tell it like a story, like you're praying to God on paper. When I started keeping this, I would tape it to the edge of my computer monitor and glance up at it a zillion times a day while I worked. Each time I looked up, a new word or phrase would pop out at me, reminding me constantly of how blessed I really was. It was as if every time I read something off that list, I was also praying it in thanks to God. And, of course, you're feeding the light wolf. Can you feel the good things, the light things, the fruits of the Spirit growing bigger and stronger inside of you? Week 7. Battle Plan. Armor. Healing Love. Looking back, I can see how my gambling set the tone for my marriage to suffer. Like a frog in boiling water, I'd begun spending more and more time on my phone, usually out of sight of my hubby, spending less and less time with him. I don't think he consciously realized it himself. As easygoing as he is, he just let me have my me time and gave me the space as I needed it. Yet, pushing him away drove him to find his own entertainment without me. He began spending more and more time on YouTube and TikTok, and even though I'm pretty confident the media he was interacting with was innocent, I don't know that for certain. He is human, and humans do dumb things, don't we? I felt awful at the mere thought that I might have nudged my hubby into a sin trap of his own. I cringed to think back on how I treated my husband while I was in the throes of my gambling addiction. It wasn't that I was mean or even irritable with him. I purposely did my best to put on a happy, normal face, no matter how I might have been feeling inside. Even if I had the worst night of losses, I would plaster on a smile that was so convincing I should have won an Oscar for my performance. He knows now what I went through, and I know it hurt him deeply that I hadn't been honest and forthright with him. But he never did know the full extent of my anguish and anxiety. I'm sure many of you can relate to this, whether it's with a significant other, or a friend, or a boss. There were times when my hubby would come into the room while I was gambling to tell me a story about something funny he saw online, or to talk about a situation at work. I dutifully put my phone down and listen, but the entire time he talked, I kept thinking about how I was going to miss out on the jackpot. Someone else was going to get it, and I'd have wasted all that money I'd been gambling for the last hour trying to land the jackpot myself. I barely listened to what he was saying. I nodded, probably saying something mundane and generic like, yep, or really, but in my head, I was just thinking to myself, go already, leave me alone and let me finish my game. Yeah, friends, that guts me to think about. I adore my husband. He's funny and smart and affectionate. There were also other times when I just didn't bother engaging with him because I didn't feel like it. Or I didn't cook anything for dinner, claiming that I wasn't feeling well so I could go lie down and gamble. I honestly think he believed it was some kind of seasonal affective disorder, a bit of lethargy and depression setting in as winter arrived. Regardless, I look back and chastise myself regarding the way I treated him. I didn't love him the best that I could. I often went several hours or even days without texting or messaging or calling friends back. I even stopped paying extra attention to the cats. No wonder I felt like an island, all alone and desperate. The best, most perfect thing you can do in this world is love other people. It's the second command that Jesus gives us after loving God. After I quit gambling, I began to see how easily Satan stole that from my world along with everything else. The ability to love on others was completely removed from my psyche. I simply didn't have the mental capacity or energy to do it. It's like 
Gambling sucked all the life out of me, leaving nothing but a zombie shell of a human being behind. Not only was that a little frightening, but it also made me regretfully sad. And it made me want to throat punch Lucifer into next year. Now that I was in the part of my recovery plan where I felt relatively calm, stable, and on the road to healing, I knew it was time I took off these self-centered blinders and focused on someone other than myself. More specifically, the man I hurt. So this week, if you can look back on your past gambling habits and see that maybe you didn't love someone as much or as big or as intentionally as you could have, let's start making up for it. Think about your spouse, your friends, your family members, your coworkers, or even your boss or your neighbor. I saw a post on Reddit about a guy who stopped gambling and couldn't figure out what to do with his boredom and free time. He mentioned having a couple of small kids. If you have children, spend more time with them. Give away your time the way you gave away your money. Spend your energy like you spent your paycheck. I'm not saying go over the top and be all weird about it. I don't want you to freak them out. But take your kids out for a fun day somewhere. Surprise your wife on a date and make sure your phone stays off. Give her all your attention. If you're a woman, give your hubby a back rub or bake him something yummy and sit down with him to talk about his day. Then listen. Really listen to what they want to tell you. My guess is they're starved for your attention and will feel an incredible amount of joy and reassurance when you give it to them in full. Here's the deal, folks. You can get the money back. Believe me, plenty of people find ways to earn and make up for what they lost. But one thing you can't get back after you spent it is time. Week 7. Recap. Let's review and recap the four battle plans we're focusing on this seventh week. Battle Plan. The Enemy's Playbook. Life will never be good again. Your enemy wants you to believe that you will forever live in poverty and need and have you convinced that you're so far beneath or behind everyone else. You may even find yourself looking at social media, seeing everyone doing and having and experiencing things that you won't get to because of your gambling addiction. You'll be convinced that your life pales in comparison to everyone else's. Don't fall for it, friends. Comparison is the biggest killer of gratitude. Battle Plan God's Intel You are special, you are blessed. Remember that God doesn't look at us the way mankind or society looks at us. The things He cares about or considers important are not the things that other people think are important. You have to stop comparing yourself to everyone else and your life to everyone else's. Money doesn't buy happiness, remember? Neither do new cars, home remodels, or expensive vacations. True story, I know a couple who worked so hard their entire lives just so that they could retire and finally enjoy life. Once they did, they sold their home, moved onto some acreage near us, and built their dream retirement home. Less than a year later, the wife died from colon cancer, which they didn't even know she had. Love and memories are far more valuable than homes, possessions, and material things. Worry about making those more than making money. Battle Plan, Weaponry, a Gratitude Journal You can read all the books or listen to all the podcasts in the world about feeling gratitude and the power of positivity, but no one can tell the story of your gratitude and thankfulness better than you can. I used to have a boss who believed in the power of positive thinking, and he always used to say, life is like a donut. But for many people, instead of putting all their attention on the soft, sweet, warm, doughy goodness with all the chocolate and sprinkles, they tend to focus on the whole. Don't be like that. Don't focus on the whole. I don't know if that was an analogy Jesus would use, but hey, it works. So whether on your phone, laptop, or real notebook, Use your journal to make a list of all the things you're grateful for and then read it every day. Battle Plan, Armor, Healing Love While in the depths of your addiction, it's likely you neglected those you love and care about, from family and friends to your spouse or even your boss. 
It's time to be you again and to reclaim the intimacy and engaging relationships you once had with those people. Love heals all wounds, and they've been hurt too. Spend some time in connection with the people around you that mean the most to you so that you can all heal together. This week's Battle Box. Video or podcast? Hey, for those of you with a significant other, go check out Brian Hatch's podcast, All In, the Addicted Gamblers podcast, and search for episode 321 titled Couples Counseling. Brian and his wife, Nicole, share an enlightening discussion about their marriage and the difficulties that come with a relationship while in recovery. Song, Help is on the Way by Toby Mack. Not only are the words so powerful with this song, but it gets me up dancing every time. Quote, Trying to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. Marilyn Monroe. Bible verse. Jesus said, Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Luke 12.15 Quick tip. Increase your brain power by making an effort to eat more healthy fats. Try eating more eggs, avocados, fish, and olives. This would be a perfect week to make fish tacos with guacamole and sprinkle a few black olives on top. Your brain will thank you. Prayer Father in heaven, I'm so sorry that I've been looking at this life you gave me and comparing it to others. I know that's a silly, shallow thing to do. You chose me for this special purpose and plan, and my journey is different from everyone else's out there. I'm unique, and I'm special to you. I want to be someone who appreciates the blessings I have and feels excitement regarding the opportunities I know await me. Fortify me with your steadfast spirit, Lord. You are my rock, my strength. Your love knows no bounds, and your promises are eternal. Remind me daily, Father, that what matters to you is not the accumulation of material things or how nice of a car I drive or what kind of vacation I take. I have an inheritance waiting for me that's eternal and therefore more valuable than the most expensive man-made thing here on this earth. Don't let me forget that, Lord. Thank you for your blessings. In Christ's name, amen. Like holy water, like sand on a bird, rain and a drought, it's all.